Yes, uh, Robert Whitey is here, award-winning director and producer of Curb Your Enthusiasm and director of a new documentary about Woody Allen. Welcome, Robert, to thank Five you. Live. Thank you, and thank you for pronouncing my last name correctly. I've heard every <laughs> variation over the past few days, and you guys got it right. You've done your homework, I guess. Oh, we've had some training. Uh, now, you previously have made documentaries uh, about comedians, one about the Marx Brothers you made when you were only 22, yes. uh, also about Lenny Bruce, Mort Sahl, W.C. Fields. How did this particular one about Woody Allen come about? Well, the same way they all have. These are all my uh, own, you know, cultural and artistic heroes and influences. And, you know, when I was very young, I was a big Marx Brothers nut, and um, no such documentary existed on them. So I thought, well, then I guess I'll have to make it. And that's really what's been behind all of these. I had been chasing Woody for some time. He was actually in my Marx Brothers film 30 years ago. And I've known him just slightly. It's funny, I'm reading reviews and articles saying, you know, Whitey and his friend Woody Allen. He's not a friend. I mean, I barely knew him. But, uh, you know, I uh, w approached him sometime in the early 80s, and he politely declined. But I was young enough that I thought, you know, I can come back to this guy every decade uh, and uh, keep asking. And so long as we both survive, maybe there's a shot. And finally, now, all this <laughs> time later, he, he caved. I mean, he's famously private. Was it hard to persuade him to take part in a project like this? It, it was, and you know, it had nothing to do with uh, content or editorial control. It all came out of that self-deprecating streak of his, which was basically, why would anybody want to make a documentary about me? Who, who am I, and who would ever want to see it? You know, because he thinks of the great f world filmmakers like Bergman and Fellini and uh, Renoir and De Sica. Those are people worthy of this kind of treatment, but not him. So that was really the big hurdle to get him over. And once I did that, and he did agree to participate, he was completely cooperative and never refused a request and never dodged any question. He was great. Actually, while you're talking about him, uh, speaking of being self-deprecating about his own work, um, well, let's hear a little clip. I put a higher value on the tragic muse than the comic muse. I've always felt that tragic writing, tragic theater, tragic film, confronts reality head on and doesn't satirize it, tease it, kid it, deflect it, opt out with some kind of a gag at the last minute. It's harder for me and I, I embarrass myself more readily, but I, I get more pleasure out of failing in a project that I am enthused over than in succeeding in a project that I know I can do well. That's fantastic. A fantastic line. I mean, you get such great access. Um, he, you know, he never allows people onto the set. He doesn't like right. publicity and stuff, does he? And you got onto the set of You Will Meet a Tall, Dark Stranger. You got into the edit room, into his home. Um, and incredible people, um, obviously. Were they all happy to talk about working with Diane Keaton, Diane Weist, Owen Wilson, Martin Scorsese? Yeah, everybody was. Everyone was actually quite flattered to be asked. Uh, interestingly, the one person who was very reticent was Diane Keaton because she doesn't like doing interviews. She's very private. Uh, you know, she'll promote her films. She'll do interviews for, for the films. But, you know, she's also very protective about her relationship with Woody. And um, the funny thing is I got a call from her assistant ask, after... Uh, uh, you know, inviting her to be in the film. And the assistant said, well, Diane wants to know if she could do this over the phone. <laughs> I said, what are you talking, what is she talking about? It's a, it's a documentary, am I gonna put her on speakerphone and then film the phone? So uh, then I told Woody, I said, I, I don't think uh, I'm gonna get your pal Keaton. And he said, well, you have to tell her that a, a, a documentary about me makes no sense without her. And I said, believe me, I told her, I told her. So he said, well, I'm going to see her this week and I'll, I'll have a talk with her. And then the next day I got a call from the assistant saying, Diane wants to know when you'd like to do this. So Woody went to bat for me, which was great. But um, no, everybody was very happy to participate. And it's interesting how many actors who work with him have come away from the experience with just very, very good feelings uh, about it. And, you know, Woody sort of is famously hands off as a director. He, he says the key is to hire the best people and then get out of their way. And I would think that actors like Martin Landau and Sean Penn, and, you know, we have got some pretty serious actors in here, Mira Sorvino, that they would want more feedback, that they'd want to talk about actorly things like backstory and motivation and character. And they said, no, that's homework we do on our own. When we're on the set, there's nothing better than a director who just 
you know, lets you go. And I they must, all appreciate that. I imagine that might be quite terrifying. There's a, a great clip with Josh Brolin on, on the set where he's, he's almost yes. like he's struggling not getting enough from, yes. from Woody. Well, there are those exceptions. And uh, it was interesting with Brolin. I mean, I, I was on the set of Tall Dark Stranger here in London for a week. And the actors he was working with that week were Naomi Watts, Josh Brolin, and Antonio Banderas. And those happened to be three actors who wanted more input from Woody. And as Woody says in the documentary, you know, if they ask me a question, I can't just sit and stare at them. I've got to answer. You know, I've got to respond. Uh, but because the actors were cooperative about letting me sort of get in their faces, so to speak, with the cameras, there is that very interesting moment in the film where... Uh, you know, Brolin seems to be uncertain about his performance in a scene, and Woody is saying, no, no, it's great, it was very natural. If you saw it, you would think it was perfectly natural. And, and, and Brolin is the one, <coughs> excuse me, the one actor on camera who says that he's not having a good time on the picture. And it wasn't about not liking Woody. He really admires Woody. It was really the other way around. It, it was that he admires this guy so much that he was so nervous about wanting to give Woody what he wanted. He said it was like being in acting school all over again and wanting to please the teacher. I we, must be. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, were you worried? Because as a, such a f huge fan of Woody's, as you make, as you make clear, as, I, as am I, I would have been worried about knowing his reputation for kind of reticence on set, that I would have been worried that you're not going to get a huge amount for him, but were you surprised about how much he gave you? I mean, I, even apart from the onset bit, which is fascinating, him driving around Brooklyn yeah. with you and looking at his where he was brought up, I was amazed that he agreed to do that yeah. and did it in such an engaging, kind of free way. I thought that was fantastic. Well, again, he, he hesitated to do that for the same reason he hesitated to have me on set, was he, he, he just feared it wouldn't be interesting. When I asked him about filming him on set, he said, you know, my sets are very boring, nothing exciting ever happens, I barely talk to the actors, you're going to be flying out from Los Angeles to London, that's a lot of money, I think you're going to be wasting your time in your film, but that said, if you, if you want to come, you can come. When I got the idea of taking him through the old neighborhood in Brooklyn, his response was, he said, who, who, nobody watching this is going to care to see me babble on about where I grew up or where I went to school or where I played stickball in the streets. Do you really want that? And I said, if they're interested enough to watch the film, they'll be interested in that. And then I said to him, I tried to give him some perspective, and I said, if you saw a documentary on someone you admire, like Bergman or Fellini or Marlon Brando, wouldn't you be interested in seeing them show you the old neighborhood where they grew up? He said, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm interested in their work. I don't care where they grew up or where they went to school. So I said, well, all right, trust me on this. And so, again, it was that self-deprecating thing that always initially hesitated, but he ultimately trusted me enough to say, if you want to do it, I'll do it. Oh, I was yeah. going to say, I've seen the three and a half hour cut of this it's film, good which is you. phenomenal and, and a joy. Yeah. Um, every, every Woody Allen's got But this version, which is, what, less than two hours? Just slightly ha less than two I have to say, I watched this version the other night, and I couldn't even work out what you'd cut. and what. How did you manage to cut uh, that hour and a half of stuff? I consider that a great compliment. As a matter of fact, there were, you know, I was the writer, producer, director, editor, but I had a number of executive producers. Right. And they were very familiar with the long cut, because you know, obviously I had to show it to them. And when they saw the shortcut, that's what they said is, yeah. we can't figure out what you cut. Yeah. And in fact, I cut almost half the film. Yeah. Um, it was interesting too. I thought the cut down would be very painful emotionally and creatively. And in fact, once I had my three and a half hour cut, I found, I mean, I still, when I look at this cut down, which I absolutely stand behind, I, I love it. And I hope people go to the cinemas to see, the cinemas to see it. Um, I, I, once I had the long version in existence, then cutting it down to me was not a big problem. As a matter of fact, I, it took two afternoons, me and my co-editor in an editing room, literally me saying, keep it, keep it, lose it, lose it, right. keep it, lose yeah. it. It was that sort of process. Yeah. And, and my feeling is that the two hours is plenty for the average Woody fan. And if you're a real Woody nut, then you'll want to get the DVD you'll later on and see the three and a half hours. Half hours. Yeah. His mother... Fantastic. Mm, yeah. you, was that Woody's own footage? That you, There's an amazing interview with his mum. In 1986, Woody started uh, making a, a documentary that was going to be about his mother and Mia Farrow's mother, the actress uh, Maureen O'Sullivan. And I don't know what the idea was, maybe just sort of a, an oil and water contrast because his mother is so different than this kind of glamorous actress. And he dropped the project. This was years before the breakup with Mia. It had nothing to do with that. I think he just lost interest. But I knew that somewhere was a three-hour interview that Woody shot with his mother. And I thought, I've got to get my hands on it. And Woody did not know where it was. He's absolutely unsentimental and not unnostalgic about anything in the past that he shot. So he had no idea where this was. And without going into the story, eventually I found it. 
And uh, so there's a, a couple of brief clips in the documentary. But I have to say, after watching, people ask me about Woody's personality all the time and why he's this way and why he's that way. And I have to say, after I'm no psychologist, but after watching a three-hour interview with Woody's mother, some start to make sense. <laughs> yes, she doesn't seem that encouraging, does she? No, she seems yeah. kind of like fairly disappointed that he went into showbiz. Well, there's that, yes. But I, I think what's touching about the, the brief interview in, in, in the documentary is her saying that she does have regrets about the mm -hmm. way she raised him because he was kind of a wild child. I mean, like probably any typical five-year-old, just a lot of running around and misbehaving and not obeying his parents. And she says, you're always running, running, running everywhere. She says, I didn't know how to handle a child like that. And she says, I wasn't that good to you because I was very strict with you. And I, I, I think maybe if I hadn't been, you would today be a you know a much warmer person i mean it's quite revealing to hear her say this and it's very moving actually seeing a seeing mother yeah, say something about that. back to the film review on five live and we have the i the oids and eyeball uh have the pleasure of being with robert whitey um whose documentary woody allen a documentary is out this weekend um i mean was there a piece of footage was there a moment that you just thought hey that's jackpot gold uh, for me probably when, when he takes you into his bedroom shows you his incredible typewriter that he has written everything he's ever written on um and he shows you the drawer yeah the idea you know i had heard about the legendary idea drawer <clears throat> and had always assumed it was like a little you know a folding file drawer you know a little desk drawer with a few scraps of paper and lo and behold and i was not expecting this uh, it wasn't even on my mind is when we were in his bedroom filming him writing uh, in longhand on his bed, which is how he writes his first drafts. Uh, he said to me, he volunteered, he said, bring the camera over here, you might be interested in this. And he pulls open, it's a full on dresser drawer filled with hundreds of pieces of paper, everything from yellow uh, legal pad to hotel stationery to napkins and matchbooks. And anytime he gets an idea, he jots it down and he throws it into the drawer. And he demonstrates for me on camera how he chooses his next picture, which is he takes these armloads of scraps of paper, dumps them on the bed and just sorts through them and picks out his next film. So yeah, that was sort of as it was happening. I thought, oh boy, this is this is this is gold. I, I know. know you should have pinched a couple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I th thought about that. Is after he left, is just <laughs> you know stuffing four or five in my pocket and going home and writing a Woody Allen movie. Um, and now obviously there's a, the, the so-called scandal, whatever you, you want to call it. Did you um, approach Mia Farrow and Soon Yi about being involved in the film, or was that <coughs> sort of an area that you didn't particularly want? To no, I in? did. You know, uh, you know, Soon Yi, I wasn't interested in talking so much about uh, the so-called scandal. It's just you know life with. Woody being Woody Allen's wife I thought would be interesting and and you know Woody said I'll ask her but her general policy is not to do anything that puts her in the spotlight she's just not comfortable with that and in fact she did pass and Mia Farrow uh, you know I, I thought there was a slim chance she would agree to an interview but I wanted that to be her decision not mine I wanted to give her the benefit of the doubt so I did extend the invitation to be in the film and um, her management was very nice they said you know she read your letter and she really considered it and she appreciates it but she is going to pass which is what I expected. I, I think it would be very, I mean, I, I do cover all that uh, business from 20 years ago in the documentary, but I never wanted it to hijack the film and suddenly turn this documentary on this man's work into a courtroom drama. Uh, and I do think it would have been difficult to just ask Mia about making these films without the conversation drifting into those areas. But still, I would have absolutely put her on camera if she had agreed to do it, but she did decline. And you do well, ask him about it, don't you? I mean, you do, it's not like, and he didn't, he didn't say, don't ask me about that thing. No, know? no, he never tried to exert any kind of control over what I would talk about or, you know, he never asked to see questions in advance. And so I sort of walked him through his life fairly chronological, <laughs> excuse me, chronological. That's not a Woody Allen cough, by the way. That's yes, my cough. I'm was. not imitating him. <laughs> uh, I've been trying to shake this thing for weeks. But, um... Uh, and we, when we got to that, I mean, to me, it was just another question to ask him. And he talked about it. And obviously, he talked about it more than what's in the film, because as he did with any topic, you know, I have to cut it down to a reasonable length. There's in the longer version of the film, the original uh, version that was on public television, there's a little more about all the business with, with Mia. But uh, I covered it to the extent that I thought was, um, you know, journalistically uh, you know, credible and, and moved on. Uh, what was your relationship to, to Woody Allen's films before and has that changed at all through making this documentary and are, are you still in touch? Yeah, we are still in touch. In fact, I just got an email from him uh, last night. Now, when I say I got an email from him, I should clarify, this is not a man who embraces modern technology. So <laughs> the email process, we did, we had, <laughs> excuse me, a lot of correspondence 
before the film and we continue now is you know I would email to him in care of his assistant she would either print it out for him to read or she'd read it aloud to him he wow. would dictate his response back and she would you know type up what he was saying and then she'd email that to me so we're still in touch and um uh, what was the first part of the question? <laughs> uh, the first part was your relationship to um, his films. I'm also quite right. interested. What did he say to you in this email? Could you oh, that I got that, that I got us? last night. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think uh, what's. Uh, uh, oh yeah, there's a very funny thing. Well, I told him. Did you say give my love to Boyd and Floyd? Well, and did actually. <laughs> yeah. God, if I'd been prepared, I mean, I could take yeah, this yeah. out right now. Yeah, the, the, there, yeah. There's something we talked about that I, I probably shouldn't go into because yeah. it's it's about somebody else's documentary about somebody else. Okay. Oh, that's and I saw it. Let's try and figure that out, everybody. <laughs> Let's come back Suggestion. to, to your, your kind of response now to the films because one of the most interesting things about making a documentary like this is that you, of course, have your opinions about the films. Mm -hmm. And I think you, like me, are a great fan of Manhattan. Now, Woody Allen, for some reason, which I can't quite fathom, is quite down on that film and, and doesn't somehow feel that it belongs at, at the sort of top of his, his canon. I mean, was that kind of awkward, that process, where you were you were saying to him, come on, come on, this is, you know, this is a good movie. This no. Good. I mean, I, I would off camera sometimes find myself in these ridiculous debates with him where I would be defending a Woody Allen film and he'd be saying basically, no, it's rubbish. It's like, <laughs> I'm talking to Woody Allen about his own films and we're taking opposing views and he's he's I'm pro and he's he's against uh, with Manhattan you know I know few Woody Allen fans who don't consider Manhattan something of a masterpiece so for him to dismiss it to the point where he says in the film that he encouraged the uh, the studio United Artists that if they would not put the movie out he'd make his next one for free and I think what it is with him is you know, we see the finished film, and that's all we know is the finished film. We either like it or dislike it. He is comparing it to what his ambition was. So I don't know what his original ambition was for Manhattan, but uh, he just felt that he missed what he set out to do. And maybe some of that was, you know, in the editing room, things that he had to lose or things that, was, that were in the initial script or whatever. So he sees himself as, as missing the mark. Whereas other films, you know, that he speaks highly of, like Purple Rose of Cairo or... Match point or a number of others, he says, yeah, the finished film is pretty much what I set out to do. So that's his gauge, which is different than how we would gauge it. Don't you want to, do, just, uh, don't you want to kind of tie him down? To go, well, now you're friends with him because you're emailing him. Just come on. And you know he, he doesn't watch his own films ever again. Just watch Manhattan again. Even though it's not what you want it to be, it is an absolutely he, beautiful masterpiece yeah. of a film comedy. Perhaps tie him to a chair. Tie him no, to a chair, no, exactly. No, no, no. Can't you do that? Now, there's a documentary. Yeah. That process right there. But uh, no. No, it's kind of, uh, you know, he famously does not watch his films again once they're finished. Now, when he goes to Cannes, part of the uh, the festival, part of the uh, protocol is you have to sit yeah. there during opening night right. with an audience, which is torture for him, but he does it because, you know, he knows he has to. But, um, you know, you mentioned things like, uh, you know, I didn't say this to him because I would never say this to Woody, but I know people... And I'm one of them who felt that Annie Hall, let's say, in some way changed their lives. Yeah, yeah. And Woody just shrugs and says, well, that's a very sad <laughs> statement about your life. You know, and he, he doesn't hate Annie Hall, but he thinks, you know, it's OK. And he doesn't quite know what all the yeah, fuss is about. Yeah. So it is an impossible it's debate to have with him. Do you, in the end, now that you've spent all this time with him, do you like him as a person? Do you kind of? I really do. He's, he's good company. And Larry David and I were comparing notes on this because, you know, Larry, like, I mean, Larry's 12 years older than I, I guess. Uh, but, you know, we both grew up on Woody Allen's films, and I was an L.A. boy, and Larry, like Woody, was a Brooklyn boy. But we both loved his work, and Larry starred in uh, uh, Whatever Works a few years yeah. ago, and I've logged all this FaceTime with Woody. And we, we were sort of comparing notes and saying that, you know, he's he strikes you as, as n you know, not so extraordinary in conversation other than he's very bright, He's well read. He can talk about anything. Uh, Woody and I have a lot of interests in common as far as, you know, filmmakers and comedians and even, uh, you know, sort of literary uh, icons and that sort of thing. So the conversation is very easy. But what's interesting is that uh, this is what Larry and I were saying is that every now and then he'll say something disarmingly funny that uh, that really has you laughing. And your first thought is, where did that come from? And then you think, well, that's right. This is Woody Allen. That's bound After to happen. All. You know, yeah. those moments must be a joy. Huh? They must must be a joy. I know. I quite and of course, we, we can't talk to you without mentioning Curb Your Enthusiasm and your amazing work with, with Larry David. Any plans for any more work together? Well, that's always up to Larry. 
and you know the arrangement with <coughs> excuse me with HBO in the states it's not the typical arrangement where you do a season you know you do a series and then you wait for them to say you're either renewed or or that's it it's an open invitation to do as much of the show as Larry wants so after a season is aired and he takes some time then he decides whether or not he wants to come back for another one we've done eight so far now I was only the full-time director, executive producer up through season five, and then I left to come here to England, actually, to do the uh, movie with Simon Pegg, uh, How to Lose Friends. Uh, so I went back. I directed an episode for series six. I sat out seven. I came back for eight. So my my relationship with the show is not full-time anymore. But I, I have a strong sense that Larry will want to come back for a ninth series, and maybe he'll want a nice round number at the end he'll come back for a tenth but that's just my can you guess. bring him over to england at all can you convince him to come? yeah I'll, I'll get him on Thanks. the phone right now Thanks. no problem okay yeah. there we go you, let's get him on the show but you, you'll all be and then the three of you can tie woody yes. to a chair <laughs> and make him watch the uh robert thank you so much my for pleasure coming by it was painless. and um woody allen a documentary is in cinema this weekend and we're going to find out where you can see the long version as well at some point and we'll let all the uh, i just mentioned know. it what was it yeah. uh, is the rio the Rio, Rio and Dawson. Rio, yeah, yeah. On, the, on June 17th, we'll be showing the full Woody, as I like to call it, yeah. uh, the entire <laughs> three-and-a-half-hour version. Wow. But the, the two-hour version in cinemas opens tonight, so please go. Thank you so much, Robert Whitey.